welcome everyone. Nice to see you. My name is Joyce Raimondo and I am the education coordinator here at the Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner House, the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. We're located in the Springs, East Hampton, Long Island, and it's 90 miles east of New York City. And today's program is Art of the Mural. So we are very fortunate today to have Netanel Port Portier with us from the Mural Institute uh, project. And she is going to tell us about herself and the project. And um, I'm sure we'll all have a lot of questions that come up around the art of the mural. So before we get started, you know, I always like to give some basics about Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. And then I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation specifically about the role of murals in Pollock and Krasner's art. And then we're gonna turn it over to Netanel and hopefully it'll stop raining and I'll be able to take you outdoors and get over to the house. And we do have uh, one original mural by Pollock in the house now on temporary display, it's a mosaic. So I hope I can get over there if it's not raining too hard, okay? So let's get started. I wanna make sure everybody has the basics of who is Jackson Pollock. Now we're not gonna go into detail today about Pollock's bio because um, we do that on another general tour. Today we're focusing on murals. So this is Pollock's uh, drip painting technique here. And um, this is what Pollock is best known for. But of course, Pollock didn't always do drip painting. Um, he started out painting scenes of American life, gradually turning input to paint mythical scenes and ideas from his imagination and becoming increasingly abstract. And this eventually gives way to these monumental drip paintings. This is called abstract expressionism. Right. This is the art that grew up right here in Eastern Long Island, where these artists came from New York City, settled out here in East Hampton and the surrounding area. And abstract expressionism is unique in that it's a physical release of energy. So it's dripping paint, pouring paint, scraping, using bold brush marks, letting the brushes show, you know, the brush strokes show. Um, even Lee Krasner would tear up her paintings and glue them back together in a new composition. So it's a very physical act of painting. And I love this picture because it shows the viewer gazing at the painting. And in modern art, the viewer, you might say, completes the painting. The viewer interprets the painting in his or her own way. There's not one way to look at modern art, okay? So what, why is my, oh, these are examples of Pollock's work. Um, so here Pollock is placing his painting on the floor. He would work from all four sides. And he said, I want, I work from all four sides similar to the in Indian sand painters of the West. So there's no top and bottom to the painting. He's an action painter. He's moving while he's painting and his movement is recorded in the final work. Lee Krasner managed Pollock's career. She put her own career on the back burner when they were married. And she always painted, but she didn't promote herself as a professional artist while Pollock was alive. And these are examples of Lee's work. She's also an action painter. These are very large scale works. You could see her movement. You could see almost like a dance and rhythmic aspect of paint. And here's Lee's iconic collage. And this one, she cut up Pollock's painting and then glued the pieces together in a new way to create a new abstract composition and then painted back into it. Sometimes she would also tear up the painting going back into her former work and recreating new compositions. So this is what these artists are best known for. So later on today, I'm going to 
uh, give you a little glimpse into the aspect of their work that pertains to murals. But before we do that, I, it is live Zoom, and I know some of you come from all over. Yesterday we had someone from England. So I wanna show you around the barn studio where Pollock and Krasnan made their masterpieces. And Natanel, I hope you enjoy it too. I hope one day you get to visit us, okay? So I'm taking off my shoes and I'm putting on these little slippers because when you come to visit the Pollock Krasna house and the barn, you get to walk right onto the floor where Pollock made his drip paintings with these slippers that we provide. Everybody remember to mute. I see someone's not muted. Someone's talking in the background. Okay, I think I got that. All right, good. So the first area in the barn um, is pretty much used for storage. And you're gonna see Lee Krasner's materials in here because Lee worked here after Pollock's death. Pollock died in 1956 in an automobile accident. He was driving while drunk. And sadly, he took a life with him, Edith Metzka. His mistress was in the car and um, she survived. Her name was Ruth Kligman. Now we have this strange skeleton here. Uh, Pollock was studying at the Art Students League and this was used to uh, draw anatomy. And I'll tell you more about his relationship with Thomas Hart Benton, his teacher. So in 1957, Lee came into the barn studio and used this as her own. And as you could see, we have historic photos on the wall and the highlight is, of course, Pollock's drip painted floor. So here we have the accidental spills and splatters. This is not a work of art. Pollock's art was very intentional. This is just the random spills where it accidentally fell on the floor. Now, why did Pollock put his painting on the floor? Here's a photo by Hans Namath that shows Pollock working. And of course, gravity pulls the paint down, right? So the paint stays wherever it lands. And like I said, he could walk all around the painting. Jackson Pollock is using house paints. He's not using art paint. And the Mexican muralist Siqueiros uh, taught a workshop in New York City that Pollock attended. And Siqueiros encouraged his students to use non-art materials and unusual tools and really to experiment um, with non-traditional tools. So Pollock would use the brush, but he would drip paint from the brush or he would use a baster and squirt it out. And of course, these are enamel house paints, okay? So after Pollock's death, Lee didn't paint for a year. And then she came into the studio and she used this for her own abstract expressionist art hanging her paintings on the wall. You can see the marks from her paintings. You could see the drips and splatters up there, okay? Lise remained here until she was an older woman. And um, she also had a place in New York City. Before she died, she arranged that this would become a museum under the auspices of Stony Brook University. And the mystery of the barn is that how is this Jackson Pollock's if Lee was in here working? Where are her marks on the floor? Well, before they both died, they renovated and they covered up Jackson Pollock's messy floor with these boards. After Lee died and this became a museum, the conservatives came in here in 1987 Lee died in 1984. They lifted off the whiteboards, lifted off the paper, and underneath was Pollock's floor, preserved forever. And that's why when you come to visit, you're looking at Pollock's floor, untouched by anyone else. So it really is magical coming here because you get to see a bygone era 
you get to see what this area was like uh, in, in those early days in the 40s and 50s when it was really rural living, country living, 200 people in the entire town, fishermen and farmers. Land was affordable. You could have a bohemian artistic life here, right? Because you could buy an acre and a half of property for $5,000. Well, those days are over. <laughs> okay. That's not true anymore. Now the area is very expensive. So um, let's talk a little bit now about Pollock and Krasna's mural projects and their mural influences equally imp as important. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little screen share. So as I mentioned, um, oh wait, let me just minimize this, sorry. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, Pollock was studying at the Art Students League with Thomas Hart Benton. And Thomas Hart Benton was an American painter who painted scenes of American life. And this is his famous mural, America Today. And of course, Benton had a strong influence on Pollock. Pollock also painted in his very early days scenes of American life. And, um, you know, Pollock was painting representational narrative art. And sometimes Pollock, like in this one, he would actually pose for Thomas Hart Benton. That figure in the right was uh, the lower right was actually inspired by, I mean, uh, Pollock was the model for that, that figure on the right there, okay? So it's really interesting uh, when we talk about murals, of course, murals beautify a space, but they also give a message, right? So this one is celebrating technology and workers. But you're going to have issues that come up when you create murals. What the values of society were in the 1930s might not be acceptable, or they might be challenged today, right? So you have a lot of issues sometimes about political ideology when a mural is created, or what is the message that the mural is sending, right? This one is, is one aspect of it is it's celebrating American life, but there were also other aspects of Benton's mural that are actually a little racy. There's like half-dressed women and it's all sorts of things. So look it up, it's a really involved project. It's America Today. Okay, so here's Pollock's painting, Going West. So you can see the direct influence of Thomas Hart Benton. This is a, an American scene of a covered wagon, wagon going west. So how does Pollock gradually become more abstract? Well, as I said, he studied with Siqueiros in this workshop that the Mexican muralist gave in New York City. This is a piece by Siqueiros. So you could see these experimental techniques. You could see on the top, there's spray paint. There's paint that's marbleized in the middle. It looks like he probably poured paint. But Siqueiros, he's creating his paintings and murals. He still has a storytelling narrative aspect in the painting, right? So you see horsemen and it looks like war and fire and so on, or explosions. This is a work that Pollock made directly following the workshop, or actually maybe it was in the workshop. And you can see Jackson Pollock's work is becoming a lot looser, a lot more experimental, but it still has an aspect of representation, right? It looks like fire, it looks like sky, it looks like maybe trees and maybe even a little horse down there but it's hinging, it's beginning to approach abstraction, okay? Now, Siqueiros was very instrumental in encouraging this, this idea of rebelling against tradition. And for Siqueiros, this was a politically charged act, rebelling against fascism and authoritarianism. 
For Pollock, it was more of an aesthetic act, right? Breaking with tradition. But, so Pollock's work doesn't just evolve out of a vacuum. This is Pollock's mural, which is a mosaic. It's, it's a small mosaic. And Pollock created this for the WPA project where he was employed. And the WPA project put people to work following the Great Depression. And um, part of that was that there was a program for artists um, that employed artists with a regular wage earning job to create murals. Most of Pollock's work was done to assist other muralists. This was the only mural that Pollock made that was original and to him, but it was never installed anywhere. We actually have temporarily on display this mural in the house because we have an exhibit right now called Picasso in Pollock. And you can see here Pollock's influence by Pablo Picasso, right? You could see the, the, um, the face, the colors aren't skin color, the curves, the patterns, the playfulness of the face, the cubist aspect of it, the movement. And um, I hope it starts raining so I can walk you over there. Lee Krasner was also employed by the WPA. And this is a um, reproduction of one, I mean, this is a framed, let me, it, this is a little hard to explain. She made this mural and it was like Pollock, it was never actually installed anywhere because the program ended. This was also the only mural that Lee designed um, for the WPA. And um, she also assisted other artists. Now at that time for this WPA project, men and women were paid the exact same amount of money. And of course, so there was no sexism in the WPA in that sense. However, later on, as these abstract expressionists grew in fame and the prices began to rise, women were slowly shut out of the galleries and um, marginalized in the history of art, but Lee did not experience that working for the WPA. And here is pa Pollock with his patron, Peggy Guggenheim, who was the heir to the Guggenheim fortune. And Peggy used her fortune to support avant-garde artists. In Pollock's case, she gave him a monthly stipend so he didn't have to work at a job or worry about selling his paintings. And um, she also lent Lee and Pollock money for the down payment on the house so they could move from New York City to Springs. So who negotiated that great deal? No, that was not Jackson Pollock. Lee negotiated that deal because Lee was Pollock's business manager. Now, what does this have to do with murals? Well, they're standing in front of the famous mural that Pollock was commissioned to make for Peggy Guggenheim. And this mural, it really shows Pollock almost approaching 100% abstraction but it's not 100% abstract, right? So it shows, it could look like figures, it could look like creatures or animals or a parade or some kind of procession, but the overall gesture of the marks, right? And the colors become much freer and you see Pollock approaching 100% abstraction in this mural. I believe right now that this mural is on display at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. I'm not sure when it's coming down. Um, so if you can get into New York City and see this mural, it is remarkable when you see it in real life. The colors are so vibrant, not like in these reproductions, okay? So if anyone's out there who wants to earn a living as an artist, how do artists make money? Well, one way is by doing mural commissions. Um, this is a, these are mural sketches by Lee Krasner that were never realized. And this is in New York City. This uh, was created by Lee 
and her nephew, Ronald Stein, who was also an artist. And um, so here you can see Lee's abstract art comes to life in public art. So, you know, we talk about sometimes the value of art and, you know, art is not a selfish act. Art is, makes life beautiful, right? When you walk down a city street and you see this. Um, I put my own work in here because before COVID, I, I uh, was a visiting author and artist visiting schools. And when I went into the schools, I noticed there were a lot of character education signs that said, be responsible, have empathy, have compassion, and all these, these really important ideas for children. And I thought, wouldn't it be good to bring these words to life um, by having children create murals? So I would work with schools and they would give me their slogan and I would make a sketch. And once that detailed sketch was approved, I would project it onto the wall. And then uh, with my assistance, we would work with literally hundreds and thousands of children to create these murals throughout Long Island. So here's an example of a finished one. So it's a positive message, not only for the children, but also for the teachers when they come into the school. And it takes those cinder block walls and bring, brings them to life. And here's an example of a sketch. Anyone thinking about doing murals, I think it's helpful to have a detailed sketch so someone knows exactly what they're getting. And here's an example of a multi-language uh, mural that was designed to bring these various facets of the community together, Haitian, Hispanic, and English speaking. So that's a little bit about myself. And we still do murals in schools, but not with the students anymore. We do them on the weekends when no one's in the building. So um, anyway, I'm gonna stop the screen share there. And um, now I am so happy to introduce Net Netanil Portier. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, okay, good. And yeah. we're going to spotlight, and I'm going to make you a co-host so you can screen share. Okay, there you go. And we're going to spotlight you. And okay. I, I can't wait. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all that. Thank you for sharing your work as well. It's beautiful. And I know how um, difficult it's been the past two years, right? When we're used to being in contact and working with youth and getting them all excited, getting their hands in the paint on the walls. Um, we've just started going back into schools this year, um, this summer with some really fun paint days. And so we're happy to get kids painting again as well. So I hope you will too soon. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then get started. So I am Netanel Portier. I am director of the Mural Arts Institute, which is a department, a program of Mural Arts Philadelphia. Uh, this is our mission statement. I always like to start out with this because as, um, as Joyce was saying, the work, you know, murals are beautiful. They, they enliven our existence, our, our urban spaces in many ways, but they also have the power to ignite change. And so this is where our work almost traces its origins back to activist mural making um, that came out of Mexico and across the United States as well. Um, and we're happy to be part of that history and, and continuing that on. Um, through our work that is both very bright, vibrant and important public art, as well as um, an engine for change um, in both in all people, place and practice, and focusing on more equitable and just uh, systems and communities in Philadelphia, as well as in other cities and countries around the world. And I'll talk about that in a second. So, I don't know if anyone has been to Philadelphia. Has anybody here been to Philadelphia? If you want to raise your hand or do a little um, emoji if you'd like to, or shout out. Um, you might know Mural Arts Philadelphia. 
um, for murals like this, you know, sort of the traditional figurative mural. Um, this is Dr. J, one of our older murals. It's been around untouched for years. Awesome. Thank you, Sandy Joe Gordon. Um, woo, my screen is not working. Here we go. Um, or ones like this um, that, uh, you know, Jackie Robinson, really important mural in the history of mural making in Philadelphia and in representation, right? You know, something Joyce was talking about also was about representation and identity and issues. I'm going to show you a lot of different examples of that. So this Jackie Robinson mural is actually a pretty old one with a newer mural from just five years ago, Rise, in the background. There's this one. That's a mural that most people recognize in Philadelphia by amazing artist Meg Seligman, Common Threads. This is one of my favorites. And all of this to say that over the years, I'm sort of showing you a little bit of a timeline of how, how murals have evolved um, and sort of historically as mural, art, as mural arts became the, the city of Philadelphia mural arts program and then created a nonprofit called, mural, called Philadelphia Mural Arts Advocates. The two together are today branded as Mural Arts Philadelphia. This is a more recent mural um, well, I guess not anymore. It's been 10 years. Um, open your eyes. I see the sunrise. This is one in a series of murals along the L in Philadelphia, painted by Steve Powers, who's originally a local graffiti artist and who's gone on to become a very well known artist based in New York. He loves Philadelphia and came back and proposed this project of love letters to the city of Philadelphia. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an idea of the scope of Mural Arts Philadelphia's work, we're one of the primary employers of artists in the city of Philadelphia and contribute immensely to the creative economy locally. We employ close to 300 artists each year because we actually produce around 75 to 100 projects um, in any given year, engaging thousands of community members, youth, students, all, you know, all sorts of participants across the city. Um, annually. Um, we have in our 35 plus years of history created over 4,000 murals. Um, now there are a, a little over a thousand that are still remaining. Most of that is due to um, development. I don't know about, about you all, but Philadelphia is under construction. There's so much new development everywhere. So, you know, murals are getting covered up, unfortunately. Communities are changing, um, but we also work to continue um, to represent people's voices and visions in their communities as much as possible. These are our key focus areas at Mural Arts Philadelphia, youth development, criminal justice reform, community wellness, environmental justice, civic discourse, and the last one, capacity building, that's where I come in. I've actually been with Mural Arts for 12 years as a project manager, head of our project management um, operations, um, and more recently, um, head of uh, the Mural Arts Institute, where we're supporting other folks in their communities and cities across the country to make change um, and do the same community building work that we do here in Philadelphia. I see someone's hand up. Do you have a quick question? Okay, it might be that just that might just be up from earlier when I asked people to shout out if, if you've been to Philly and seen the murals. And that's okay. If you, if anyone here does have questions, please write them down. I'm just going to go straight through this so I don't lose my flow. Um, and I hope we'll have time at the end for some Q and A. If anybody has any questions about any any of the things that I'm sharing with you today. So how do we do our work? Our work is about listening, about identifying needs and opportunities. Some of our projects start with an idea that comes to us um, by an artist. Some are ideas that we come up with at Mural Arts um, in response to current issues, in, in response to a, a, a site, a specific location, an opportunity. And in many cases, it's really about listening. It's a res about responding to folks who can apply for a mural in their community, responding to um, different mayoral initiatives or different department partners that we have across the city and the goals they're trying to achieve and working in partnership with them. It's about collaborating and co-powering. So along the way, in every phase of a project, we are working together with community, with people who are either neighbors to where a mural will be um, produced or people who are engaged in the issue that we're looking to address through the actual mural project. 
because for us, the creative process is part of a greater change that happens in addition to transforming a public site through a beautiful mural. We imagine together and we create the murals also along with everyone. So we actually have perfected a technique of using um, a specific cloth. People call it parachute cloth um, or poly tab. There are lots of different names for it. It's actually an acrylic non-woven substrate um, that is um, actually used in the garment industry, sort of like the lining that's in clothing inside of jackets, for example. There are different thicknesses of this and it's a really great product because it's acrylic, it actually binds together with the acrylic paints that we use to produce the murals. And it's very light, so it's very easy to use. Um, so we actually do, a, we create a lot of our mur murals using this technique because we can project the design onto the sheets of cloth or actually pre-print it in some cases on big printers. And then we can take that cloth almost anywhere. We take this cloth into prisons, into detention centers, into waiting rooms, into hospitals, into schools. We do paint days outdoors in the rain under pop-up tents, out on the grass. We do paint days in any location imaginable, pro imaginable probably at this point. Um, and this is, it's, it's really wonderful. This really cements people's participation in the mural production. It's not just about them envisioning the themes and um, the goals they want to achieve through the project. It's about them also designing the mural with the artist and putting their hands to the paint and cementing that, that participation. And a really important aspect not to, not to forget is actually celebrating these works, right? Celebrating the people who are part of this work, celebrating everybody's achievement and the beautiful works of art. Now I'm gonna run through a bunch of different examples. I'm not gonna go into detail on all of these projects because there are way too many slides here, but I thought you'd enjoy just seeing a lot of really diverse um, images and different murals that we've produced over the years. And I'm gonna share them with you sort of by program area and focus area in terms of our goals. So community murals and civic discourse, these murals are a lot in response to community requests. You know, sort of the traditional idea oftentimes of honoring whether they're contemporary heroes or historic important figures in, um, in Philadelphia or in specific neighborhoods, um, celebrating you know, folks who have really had an impact in their community and had changed and made changes um, in the city of Philadelphia is something that has, has been really important to community members over the years. We also do works that maybe are sometimes more abstract and about beauty and inspiration and about promoting different forms of public art and artistic practices. This is a more artist um, abstract work that I, I really adore. A really recent one, this one as well. This mural was actually created by a photographer um, who does a lot of portraiture. Um, so this is really wonderful um, that they have this opportunity to create a mural and take their photographic process and do something a little different with it. We also engage with really important social issues. This is a mural that was created around the time that um, uh, our former president was cracking down on immigrants and um, undocumented uh, community members uh, in our city and all over the country. Um, so this mural, Families Belong Together, was really important and a really important moment to create this mural, actually, people turned this, this mural project into a poster that became really, really po popular and um, really important. A lot of activism that happened in Philadelphia around, um, around these issues of immigration. We, we partner a lot with different departments across the city of Philadelphia. We partner with the Water Department, Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Human Services, the Justice Department. Um, yeah, I can't even, there's, there's so many that we partner with. This project in particular is partnering with PennDOT, um, the entity that manages the railways um, and um, uh, a lot of roadways um, in Philadelphia. And um, we've been creating a series of murals in the underpasses um, of those areas that are often really dark and scary. And we've been transforming them into these beautiful, vibrant, spaces that are representative of the communities that live in these spaces and, and, and traverse these spaces every day. 
we partner oh yeah we partner with the department of parks and rec there's like a they are a long lasting partner um when the city of philadelphia mural arts program first first started and grew out of the anti graffiti network with its leader jane golden our executive director and founder of mural arts philadelphia who's still with us um she actually um formed the mural arts program as a as a as an initiative of the Department of Recreation at that time, who had a really um, innovative leader and um, helped Jane really grow the program and create the nonprofit that then was able to really expand mural arts's reach across the city and to develop new partnerships and bring more funding to this work. And this was, you know, back in the 90s. And then zoom forward to today, this is an image from 2016. But um, about every year, except for maybe last year, we didn't do this because of COVID. Um, we've been uh, taking over the space. It's actually the Eakins Oval in front of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So this picture is actually taken um, either, I think it's from a lift <laughs> in front of the Museum of Art, probably in front of the Rocky statue overlooking um, this uh, huge esplanade, which is just a parking lot during the year and in the summer. We transform it with this beautiful mural and activities and food trucks and all sorts of programming um, throughout the summer. So we do this on an annual basis and highlight a different artist's work each time, which is really exciting. We also do a lot of transformation of spaces with schools. Um, and this is actually a project through our environmental justice department. Um, where they not only worked with an artist in residence in this school over a, a year of time working with youth, they also worked with the parents of the youth in the school and the neighbors and explored the different um, origins and um, nationalities of the folks who were uh, who attend this school and the families in this community and their relationship with their foods and and growing and you know their, their sort of um, their culture um their agricultural culture um and tastes and smells and developed a mural that wraps around the entire school based on their drawings and journals through their process of sort of exploring their um their this, this sort of culture of agriculture and food culture um they also really focused on wellness and what kind of spaces in that schoolyard they needed for youth to be well to feel safe um healing spaces as well and spaces that the neighbors and community members themselves could come in and use and contribute to the school so these garden beds were planted by many of the mothers and grandmothers and aunties um, of the kids at this school and they care for these plants and they grow specific herbs and and, and products that they use in their um, recipes at home regularly and uh and this also is another aspect of our environmental justice work which is connected in some cases to climate justice to inequalities in terms of how um, black and brown people are more greatly affected by not only environmental laws and displacement but also climate change um and uh and you know and and trash in many cases is not um it's sort of a, a symptom of all of those things combined um and through this program called trash academy youth elderly folks uh, become leaders in their community to advocate around people understanding what's in their trash where where their trash comes from where it goes um that whole system and how it impacts larger um, issues of climate change and um, environmental racism as well. Youth development, working with youth. We do, we work in schools, we work after school. Um, we work, you know, with science teachers, history teachers to develop projects with Parks and Rec. Again, you can see here, we have a mural mobile that takes us all over the city to rec centers um all over the place i think the city of philadelphia is um the city that has the most rec centers per like square footage or population in the entire country um i think it was back in the the 60s or 70s where they were really progressive and wanted to make sure that there were rec centers everywhere that people had access to recreation in their parks and activities so they built all these rec centers and then as everybody knows you know the industrial 
collapse and then everything went downhill from there. So we have all of these amazing rec centers that, that are now coming back to life and, and hopefully that we're you know keeping vibrant and, and with programming and all sorts of access for youth and you know all sorts of folks for activities and, and things on the weekends and during the day. So during actually the pandemic, something that was really important to the city of Philadelphia was play streets was this initiative they created where they would um, uh, shut down streets all across the city in different neighborhoods as much as possible for these um, pop up uh, sort of uh, block parties or festivals with activities for the kids in the neighborhoods, um, because most of these kids weren't in school during the year. Um, people were feeling more comfortable outdoors um, in the nice weather and mural arts was a huge part of that we created hundreds and thousands, I think, even of paint kits um, that could be distributed along with um, with meals at some of the different learning centers, um, as well as actually showed up with our truck, with our mural mobile, aprons, mural pieces, kits, everything, and just, you know, engage as many people as we could across the city during the summer while the summer was nice and people could get outdoors. A lot of our work with youth is about um, them envisioning their futures um, and bringing their dreams to life. This mural actually incorporates QR codes as well, where people could learn about the dreams and visions of the youth involved in this project. This mural here is by artist Amy Sherald, huge, huge deal. Amy Sherald is the artist who painted Michelle Obama's portrait. We actually reached out to her before she was selected for that commission and our work with her got pushed back a couple of years because she became so popular, but she stuck to her commitment with us and worked with a whole group of youth. And this is actually one of the students from a class in Philadelphia who had gone up to her studio with their class to learn about how she designs and produces her, her paintings. Um, and they conducted a photo shoot with her and she picked um, this photograph that then uh, we helped reproduce for this, uh, I think it's a six story tall building in downtown Philadelphia. So all, you know, again, think about just the, the beauty of this piece, the look on her face and the fact that this is a young student in Philadelphia public schools who is now six feet tall in downtown Philadelphia and just how incredible she looks and just how amazing this and powerful this mural is. So thinking about representation, about who's represented in our public spaces is an important part of our work as well. This is a mural with poet Ursula Rucker. Um, and so this was a lot about combining uh, youth voice literally in their poetry um, along with the mural. They created a whole, um, a book of poetry along with this mural as well. Porchlight is about community wellness. We work with immigrants across the city and we create hub spaces that are literally in um, empty storefronts um, in, uh, in neighborhoods so that we're really on the ground in the communities that we wanna serve. And we, we couple art making and public art making along with all sorts of different social services or or classes or workshops, whether it's ESL, English language classes, or um, civics classes um, to help folks prepare for their naturalization uh, tests. We do all that and more. Um, we help, we have, we have helped folks uh, start their own businesses, whether it was weaving textile, um, you know, getting, connecting folks to other opportunities as well in the work that we do. This mural represents um, over 40 different languages that are exist in that neighborhood um, through a project where the artist worked with youth um, and their parents to translate some of the words and, and symbols and uh, in, in the many different languages of folks in Southeast Philadelphia where this is located. We work in Northeast Philadelphia where there are a lot of immigrants and refugees um, from Sudan, from Iraq, and more. Our hub space way of working has become so popular that we also created a hub space more recently in Kensington, Philadelphia, which is um, at the heart of the opioid epidemic in Philadelphia. Um, and this is about creating a healing space, a welcoming space that is open to all no matter where they are in their journey um, of, uh, of 
chemical dependency or recovery from that type of addiction. Um, people who are housing insecure as well and working with the community impacted by all of that happening um, on their streets and in their neighborhood. This is a garden cleanup day. Um, this is a wonderful uh, poem um, created by participants who have uh, been working in that hub space for some time. So we don't only do murals, we create work sometimes that are sculptural, sometimes uh, we define public art as a, a public event. There's a performative aspect to some of the work that we do as well. Um, and this work is a work by Swoon, who's a really popular um, street artist, contemporary urban artist, um, who came to Philadelphia and spent a year in our Kensington hub space um, working with folks who are housing insecure and um, uh, facing all sorts of challenges in their lives. And this actually, this is a portrait of a lot of the leaders in that space and people who have become important um, members of the family of that specific hub space. Another aspect of Porchlight is actual workforce development while connecting people with social services. This is a project um, that uh, offers uh, daily employment to folks who are housing insecure, um, working to actually paint murals um, in partnership with uh, SEPTA, with our uh, transit system um, in the underground tunnels uh, between the different train stations in downtown Philadelphia. So, um, Folks get paid in cash that day, they get connected to different services, and they're also um, painting these awesome murals and in some cases doing much, much more than that. So here's some photos of that. Restorative justice. What does justice look like today um, in, a, in, you know, in a city where a third of the population is under, is well below uh, the national poverty rate and where there are many too many um, people of color who are actually incarcerated. Um, and so we work with folks in prison, out of prison to produce murals. Um, this is an artist who's become world renowned for his work and has gone on to curate other um, works of artists who are formerly incarcerated as well. Um, this is Russell Craig. And this is a work as well as a slide before that's on the front of our municipal services building in Philadelphia. We do a lot of transformation of rec centers um, in Philadelphia with the Guild program, which is a program for returning citizens coming out of incarceration, um, where they not only paint wonderful murals, they do a lot of their own artwork, um, but there's also a whole workforce development component to this as well, where they're being trained in other um, techniques and tools as well. And just it, even in creating a mural, all the soft skills that they're practicing and con contributing to this work will help them in the future as they apply to jobs and begin to work um, in Philadelphia. We connect them to a lot of, to, to directly to jobs as well in many cases. They do woodworking, scaffolding builds. Um, we've also worked with families impacted by incarceration. This is a mural about that subject um, where the, um, the QR codes also, you can use that to listen to people's stories. <laughs> so here's some photos of the guild doing their amazing work. We also have a women's guild that was just inaugurated this year specific for um, women who were formerly incarcerated. We've worked with the Barnes Foundation. I wanted to throw this one in um, just because it's an incredible institution in Philadelphia. Um, if you don't know about the Barnes Foundation um, and that collection of impressionist and post-impressionist work, um, it's, it's the number one in the world, I believe, right? Um, and uh, we worked with them with folks um, who are incarcerated and this is the still life. And uh, the participants in this project spoke about how they felt their lives stood still when they were in, you know, where they are, that things were still around them. And so that, that, that theme um, was an important part of their selecting together their inspiration for what they wanted to create it in their, in their mural together. They felt that life just kept going on without them outside of the walls. And so I'm the head of the Mural Arts Institute. I'm not gonna go into this because I wanna make sure there's times for Q and A, um, but uh, we do all sorts of consulting with folks across the country, across the world, whether it's helping folks develop projects, new mural programs. We do capacity building for other artists. We work with different municipalities and starting up mural programs. 
Um, and we have a lot of research we've produced as well as symposia and programs that you can check out online if you're interested in our work and interested in making a change in your community and trying to figure out how to do that. Please feel free to give us a call. So what does this work look like? What does change look like? This is just an example of some of the things that we're able um, to change through the murals that we create. Um, right, like, you know, changing certain systems, creating more support for artists and cultural strategies, um, sustain local stewardship of public space, right, like, you know, making it clear how important public space is and the belief that we have that folks should be part of making decisions of what those spaces look like and how accessible they are to them and who's represented in those spaces. Our process requires us to staff up appropriately, find the right artists. It's not any artist who's able to do this work. It's both a mix of being an, you know, a talented technician in, in, in terms of painting and designing, um, but also um, being the right fit in terms of being a good listener, approaching this work with humility and generosity and a true um, wish to connect with others because this work really can only advance as deep as the relationships are that are built on trust and time, right? Uh, so a lot of the time, you know, we really look to create multi-year commitments um, in doing this work. And something that we use, a term we use a lot also is generative. Um, it's really important to us that the work we create generates more work, more opportunity, more change, more vision, more dreams. Um, and that can lead to almost anything, you know, re wrapping recycling trucks, performative public art, um, leaders um, growing through these pr processes, people coming together who maybe had not come together before, um, and just, you know, transforming spa beautiful spaces, uh, supporting community wellness across the city um, with folks um, nonstop. So that's, that's what we do. I hope I did not speak too fast. There's always so much we have to share. Um, so it's hard to choose what to share and what not to share um, with an opportunity such as this one. And thank you, Joyce, for inviting me um, for this opportunity. Natanel, let's give Natanel a virtual round of applause. That was extraordinary. And I'm sure, I'm sure everyone feels somewhat the same that I feel. That is truly inspiring. And it actually gives me faith that human beings are basically good. We've been through a really rough time and this really restores my faith in people, honestly, it shows what goodness can do and how it does generate more goodness. And I know you must work really hard to put this all, you know, together with your staff and the artists and all the people you work with building relationships. So thank you so much. And everybody, we do have time for questions. So I want you to, um, you could either put your question in the chat and I'll read it, or you can just how about we'll we'll go with that? Yeah, someone actually just chatted me a question. Um, how are the buildings selected? Um, asking about private property owners who want to create their own murals. Like, are there is are there any you know permits or things like that? Um, so it really depends on where you are. In Philadelphia, there actually isn't uh, any permitting required for house painting or mural painting. <laughs> Um, unless it looks like signage, unless there's a lot of uh, words in it, then you probably need to get a permit from l and I because you're probably you're trying to send a message. We do not do advertising at mural arts. Um, however, we do sometimes um, need to are required to get um, to go through the art commission or the historic commission in Philadelphia for approvals based on where the murals are located, if they're located in a historic district or a really public area of the city, um, we will go through um, that process as well. And especially make sure that the community we were working with knows that that process exists um, and that that, you know, and what that timeline looks like and that there may be a back and forth at a certain point, um, if there are any concerns from those commissions. Um, so that's a really good question. And private property owners come to us. Sometimes we help them out. We are constantly asking permission from private property owners <laughs> to use their walls. They are our friends. They are part of our community. Um, so that's a really good question. Thanks. 
the flower show. We love the flower show. We actually have done a couple things with them before when um, we had actually an artist from Paris who is an urban artist and muralist who's known for working in the Parisian catacombs who did a whole installation with a florist whose theme thematic was the catacombs of Paris. Um, so we have, have done some unique collaborations through the flower show. Let Cleveland. Me, um, hang on, hang yeah. on. Yeah. Let me read the question for the sake of clarity. <laughs> sure. This is sure. Recorded, okay. So Amy says, I'm in Cleveland. Have you done any consulting here? If not, we're missing out. What's the best first step? Thank you so much for asking that. We have not done consulting in Cleveland. I believe that you do have some muralists there and some folks who have been organizing projects there. Um, and they may have even sent a couple muralists to participate in a training with us a couple years ago, if I remember correctly, it may have been Cleveland. We have done work in Akron, Ohio, which is not too far away. Um, but I know that Cleveland is a really vibrant city for the arts as well. Oh, and what can they do? The best first step, they should reach out to me. <laughs> um, feel free to email institute at muralarts.org um, and let us know, you know what, you're, what you're looking for, what kind of support you need. Um, we're actually just revamping our website right now. By next week, there will be an updated menu of um, different forms of consulting that we offer, whether it's hourly support or really you know, putting a proposal together to help someone develop a program or a project. We really try to be responsive, just like we're responsive to our communities and our mural projects. It's really about meeting the needs of the folks who reach out to us. And what is the website? So it's muralarts.org, muralarts.org. I can put it in the chat. Um, and if you want to um, look for the Institute, if you're interested in consulting or um, some of the research um, and programs, it's just slash institute afterwards. And feel free to email the institute. And here's the email address. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I have, I have a technical question. Um, you mentioned that fabric. Mm -hmm. And um, how does that, what, that gets glued onto the surface ultimately? Yes, it does. We actually use an acrylic gel, um, not unlike gel medium um, that you can, you know, golden paints. We actually, most of our paints and, and all of our gel, um, we purchase from golden paints in large quantities that we store because as you saw, we, we produce so much. So we have, <laughs> we have a really good relationship with golden paints um, and use that gel to adhere the cloth to a wall. So the wall is always cleaned primed first, then the gel is put on the wall, the gel is put on the back of the acrylic sheet, and then glued up and squeegeed, um, similar to wallpaper on the wall. It actually dries pretty fast. And as it dries over you know, a full 24 to 48 hours, it actually shrinks a little bit and really um, adheres to the wall almost, you, know, you can almost not tell that the that cloth was used to paint the mural it just looks like a coating of paint afterwards wow that's remarkable and so on those very large outdoor wall murals are though is that one sheet or those are smaller panels so all the panels are usually five by five foot so the roll of the poly tab actually comes in a five foot long a five foot wide roll about 350 feet long um, and we usually use those rolls cut them up in five by five sheets that's usually the most manageable for one or two, for usually it's two people at the very least who are installing the cloth together because it is a certain, <laughs> it is labor intensive in, in a certain way. Wow, that's remarkable. So, and the, the yeah. actual paint itself is acrylic paint. Do you, do you, yeah. do you uh, finish it with something so that it doesn't fade or crack? Yeah, we, yeah, we use top coats. We actually use um, top coats provided by um, Sherwin Williams. Um, we do not use anti graffiti coatings because the ones that we've tested out are sometimes a little sticky. Um, but there have been some new advancements in that technology that we might test out. Um, but, you know, depending on which way the wall is facing, if it's getting a lot of sunlight, we might use um, heavier types of top coats, um, like an, an like an MSA varnish. 
Um, and there's one that Golden actually produces that works really well that we might use on certain murals that are hard to reach, that face the sunlight so that we don't have to go out often, um, as often to retouch them. Wow. Um, because there are some colors, as you know, that might fade more quickly than others. So we wanna be careful of that as well. Wow. That's remarkable. The scale yeah. of those, those murals are remarkable. And just as a side note, my friend told me that I'm sure there's a lot of tour companies that offer tours around Philadelphia mm -hmm. to see these murals. And now that's on my bucket list. We actually have our own tours oh. program. So you go to muralarts.org. At the top, there's a button for tours and you can book a tour. You can join a tour. We have regularly scheduled tours, walking tours, trolley tours. If you want to do something for a particular group of people in the future, maybe through this opportunity, um, we could plan, um, you know, when the pandemic is over, an experiential tour is really great, where you not only visit the tours on a trolley, but then you actually do a participate in painting one of our murals that's happening um, in a studio. So um, yeah, that's definitely, it's an important um, aspect also of our work is sharing it, sharing it with others, telling the stories about this work. It's remarkable. And I think that also attests to the power of art to not only make the city more vibrant, but to also contribute to the economy. Yes. Because right? art is tourism. Yeah. Art is tourism. Art is employment. Art is just making our spaces better and more accessible and um, more useful even. Um, during the pandemic, we partnered with um, the Department of Public Health in the city of Philadelphia. We commissioned, I think, hundreds of artists to create um, these space pads, we're calling these stickers on the ground to help folks, you know, keep their six feet distance in the supermarkets and the, in, um, uh, in the post office and all sorts of public spaces. You can see them all over Philadelphia. I was even in the suburbs visiting my sister the other day, like 40 minutes outside of Philadelphia, and they had our mural art stickers on the ground in the supermarket. I was shocked. <laughs> um, and we've, you know, done all sorts of campaigns across the city, posters, mini murals, pop-up murals with hand washing stations outdoors um, during COVID, um, just, you know, getting the message out about um, testing, vaccination, all of that, you know, hand washing, masking. We've, you know, been part of the, the public campaign across Philadelphia and employing artists, not unlike the WPA mm -hmm. back in the day. They knew art yeah. is, 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 is more than art. It's useful for so many things. Yes. So anybody else out there who has any questions, comments, ideas, inspirations? I did get one other um, direct message um, asking about a graffiti problem in Philadelphia. Is there a graffiti problem? There has always been and will always be graffiti <laughs> in any, any urban environment. What we've learned over the years is that the murals actually aren't often tagged um, if they're done well, if they're done in community, by community, with community. If the community is directing the project, there will not be graffiti on that mural. Mm -hmm. um so that's you know that's what we've learned and um and that's what we continue to do and uh, you know if things do get hit with graffiti if folks that just weren't from that neighborhood somewhere else um the way we approach it is to fly into action right away and remove that graffiti mm -hmm. and that just sends a message right away that you know don't even bother touching our murals because we're ready to to keep them intact and we have a crew actually who are city employees still today um, who do that work. That's a very small percentage of murals. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, ideas? Well, I'll tell you, anybody? Feel free to reach out. <laughs> we gotta do start video, whoops. Yeah. I guess somebody's coming through. Does anybody want to ask a question? <clears throat> Put it in the chat and we can read it. I see my friend Pearl Golden is on here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Questions, ideas? 
Pearl, unmute if you want to say something. Okay, wait, I'm trying to get that to work. We can and hear you and we can see you. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. It worked. So I'm here with my friend Kate Outless, Outloops, and we are in C in outside of Seattle. <laughs> and caught you and heard your incredible program. My God, that is really remarkable. <clears throat> I worked in in um, art education programs um in all different ways and i mean it, the amount of things that you are doing is just absolutely extraordinary and i really just wanted to commend you because truly yeah. truly special very inspiring and, and good to see my friend joycey <laughs> <laughs> wait that's it all we get very personal on these oh, days. That's, great. Um, that's great and i also have my zoom friends who i've never met in real life so hi pearl <laughs> so let's see who else is on here uh julie tony carol Maris, <laughs> sandy cynthia and amy which do you have or joanne any questions or ideas I'm busy texting my friend and art teacher in the Cleveland public school systems. I've taken pictures of all the slides and I'm saying you have to connect with her. We will, you know, we're, we're just about, um, we have a mural arts Institute newsletter. So if you email us and say, add me to your newsletter, um, we're sending out a heads up on, we don't have the dates exactly yet, but this winter we'll have a series of trainings um, available through Zoom. So that might be something to send to your friends um, if they want to uh, do some training with us. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Anybody else? Well, I'll tell you what, it is really a great example. You mentioned employment and, um, you know, a lot of young people who are embarking on their college education and, you know, that, you know, artists, find ways of being employed. And these programs are really so important. As we're closing, I could just scoot over to the house and show you Pollock's mosaic, okay? Oh. Awesome. Okay, so here's the property. So Netanel and everyone, I hope you come to visit in real life one day. It is extraordinarily uh, beautiful here. And that's why so many artists came here ever since the Long Island Railroad could cart artists here um, in the late 1800s. This has been a hub for some, some great artists. And here's the farmhouse that Pollock and Krasna moved into in 1945. Um, there's a little meeting in here, so I'm just going to show you the mural with no talking. So here is Pollock's mosaic, and this is temporarily on display in our exhibition Picasso in Pollock. And if you want to learn more about Picasso's influence on Pollock, you can go to the website picassoinpollock.org, or you can come visit. And we have a replica of Guernica, which is, of course, Pollock's, uh, Picasso's famous mural, um, anti-war mural. And the reason it's on display is because Pollock was very influenced by this mural that he saw at the Museum of Modern Art. And this is a replica, of course. And you can see here in one of Pollock's original paintings that we have in the house, way up here, there's actually a horse's head, uh, which is very much stylized like Picasso. And this whole composition is very similar to the Mexican muralist um, Orozco had a painting that's strikingly similar in composition to this. Not the style of it, but the idea of horses and people walking in a procession and so on. 
So we do give talks about Hispanic art and its influences on Pollock, but that's just a little taste of that. So um, we are gonna close now. And before we do, I wanna give the biggest thank you to Netanyahu for inspiring us. Like, I, I really can't even put into words. I'm sure everybody here feels that way. And we know how hard you work to generate this kind of creativity and community um, working together. So thank you. And, thank you so uh, much. And next week at the Pollock Krasna House, we have physical challenges, creative opportunities, and that's a free Zoom program. And I'm gonna be talking about how Matisse and Krasner and many other famous artists use their physical challenges and very severe disabilities in some cases to actually create a new kind of art. And we have a special guest speaker, Matt Rayner, who's a young man who was paralyzed from the neck down in a boating, uh, a diving accident about a year and a half ago. And he uses technology, technology to create the most extraordinary photographs. And he's gonna be speaking live. So um, get the word out, come to that one. And um, Natanelle, any closing remarks for people? No, not really. Just thank you so much for, for joining today. And I hope that I'll have the opportunity to connect with you or other folks that you want to send my way. Um, you know, we really are happy to catalyze change, catalyze art, transform public spaces together with others. So thank you so much and continue all of your work, whatever you're doing in your creative spaces. Thank you so much. And I hope to get to Philadelphia. I can't wait. Road trip. <laughs> okay. Seriously. Bye, everybody. Have a good evening. Stay safe and, and happy. Thank you.